Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. Since you can't come down to the grill room, we thought we'd bring the grill room to you. Uh, our speaker today um, first started sailing when he was a young kid. His first memories of being on a boat were when he was three or four with his father on a wooden fishing boat in the East Battle Lake in uh, Minnesota. Uh, by 14, he was banging around in a little 14-foot skiff, which had an ice boat jib. And if you have ever raced an ice boat or sailed an ice boat, you know why that would be a real flat jib. These are high-speed creatures. Um, in his middle 20s, he found himself in Australia as, as a teacher down there. And he was racing around uh, in Adelaide in a, a lightweight Sharpie. Those are cool rides as well. Um, in 1988, he bought an Olsen 30 WYSIWYG and sailed around the bay in it. Uh, to date, our speaker has raced in eight Pacific, eight Coastal Cups and two Pack Cups. In 2010, he had the good fortune to buy a Wiley Cat 30. We all know Tom Wiley is quite a brilliant designer, which is incredibly simple and thoughtful and good boat the Wiley Cat 30s are. Um, so, uh, in 2018, uh, our speaker took second in the solo Trans-Pacific race from San Francisco to Honolulu Bay, and in 2018, he also was the single-handed champion of the Single-Handed Sailing Society's season championship created after their nine-race series, and in 2019, he drew the short straw and was elected Commodore. Uh, of the Single Handed Sailing Society. So please welcome our speaker today, uh, Commodore of the Single Handed Sailing Society, Don Mark. Don, welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Lunch. Well, thank you, Ron. It's uh, my pleasure to represent the uh, Single Handed Sailing Society and to give you a brief history of the SSS and uh, culminating in a discussion of our biggest race, the Three Bridge Fiasco. Uh, I started sailing in the Single-Handed Sailing Society in the early 90s. And what drew me to it was the high level of seamanship that was necessary to be able to participate. And there were some amazing names at that time. Uh, Stan Honey, Mark Rudiger, Frank Dismore, Dinsmore, Peter Hogg, Bruce Schwab, Skip Allen, Dan and Linda Newland. And um, I found that it was a big step to leave the crew behind and go out and sail around the Fairlawns, for instance. It wasn't until later when one of our members, Jackie Philpott, published this book that I really got a, a look at the early days of the Single-Handed Sailing Society, which I knew nothing about. Uh, a lot of it revolves around George Siegler, a pilot um, and adventurer who had kind of a survivalist store in Oakland and did such crazy things as sail to Hawaii in an inflatable raft with his survival equipment, which includes, you see that little globe there, that's a salt water still to distill salt water into fresh water and uh, other things. Um, he's quite a clever guy and quite an adventurer. One of the things he had with him, or that came out of this, was a way to determine longitude by, not with a sextant, but by taking sunrise and sunset, getting the length of the day, dividing it in half, and then using that time against Greenwich Mean Time to, uh, to determine where you were. Well, of course, a raft wouldn't be moving very fast, so there was very little error involved in it. But it's the sort of person he was, and he was very much the catalyst for creating the Single-Handed Sailing Society. One of the first things he did is said, let's go to the Farallons. So um, 
1987, I might think that might be 1977. I might have a typo there. Um, he said, well, let's go to the Farallon. So uh, about 40 boats signed up. The Coast Guard put a cutter out there because <laughs> everybody thought that this would be a terrible idea. But it went well. And it was won by this guy by the name of Bill Lee in a new boat called Merlin. <laughs> So that I've was heard of Bill, <laughs> heard of Merlin. Huh? You know. I think I've heard of Merlin. <laughs> yes. Many people have. Oh, so um, after the single handed Farallons, then he said, Well, let's go to Hawaii. <laughs> and wow, there's a, there's another big step. So the first race was nineteen seventy-eight. Uh and a fellow by the name of Norton Smith was the first winner on a Santa Cruz 70. There have, I believe there was a Santana 22 in the first race. Um, at one time, Reed Overshire sailed a folk boat to Hawaii. And, uh, you know, again, there's, uh, Stan Honey and Dan and Linda Newland, Newland sailing separately against each other. <laughs> um, and um, uh, and keeps going. I'll go to the next slide. Uh, there we, there's a boat anchored in Hanalei Bay, the uh, the beautiful uh, destination, a wonderful place to get to. Um, in order to qualify for the uh, single-handed uh, Trans-Pacific Yacht Race, we have a series of seminars, which we strongly encourage people to do. This was uh, the beginning of the series for this year's single-handed uh, Trans-Pacific Race. Unfortunately, we have postponed it until 2021. Um, here are some of the records for the uh, single-handed Trans-Pacific race. Uh, Stan Honey owns it for, uh, on his Cal 40 Illusion. Um, and um, for multi-hulls, Steve Fawcett on his tri Lakota. In seven days, 22 hours, <laughs> 38 minutes and 26 seconds. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, that's a great, great boat, boat, Lakota. I love yeah. sailing that boat with Steve. Really good ride. Um, here's a typical sem seminar schedule. Uh, included emergency rudders, power and communication, rigging and sails, the return trip, provisioning and medical considerations, and weather routing. Um, we are particularly proud of our safety record at the Single-Handed Sailing Society, and knock on wood, we'll continue to be proud of it. Um, I believe that for the first um, Single-Handed Transpac, everyone just assumed it would be a great failure with people dying and boats getting lost, but everybody made it, and everyone continued. Um, on alternate years, we have a qualifying race for the um, single-handed trans-Pacific race called the Long Pack. And since we really don't have any place to sail to, if you sail upwind, you know, you might not make it in, you know, a week or anything like that. So someone came up with the idea of just sailing straight west to a longitude, which I believe is... 132 something, I could be wrong, somewhere in there. 200 miles out, 200 miles back. That's a 400 mile qualifier. And this is my track in 2017. Mm -hmm. Going out and coming back. And what book did you do that in? I did that in the Wiley Kent. Mm -hmm. And one of our uh, 
qualifying requirements is you have to do a qualifying race in the boat you're going to Hawaii in. So if you did the race once and you buy a new boat, you have to start over again. You have to show proficiency in the boat you have. Um, other races that we sponsor throughout the year are the Vallejo 1-2, an interesting race. In fact, the uh, Single-Handed Sailing Society has several interesting races, but this is our last race of the year in which we sail single-handed from the Berkeley Circle to Vallejo, spend the night there, and then sail back double-handed. And uh, it's been a good way to uh, get people interested in single-handed, single-handing for the nice, easy, usually downwind ride with the current to Vallejo. And then uh, you need a little help to get back against the wind and against the current to come back to Richmond. Uh, we also have a race to Drake's Bay, um, which we are now doing in cooperation with the OIRA, and we have a single committee for both of them. Um, and um, Half Moon Bay is another race where I believe we used to do it both ways, but now we uh, uh, do it one way down to Half Moon Bay and we take our time getting back. Um, in the springtime, we have three races in the bay. The first one is the um, Three Bridge Fiasco, which I'll get to in just a minute. The next one is the Round the Rocks race. And uh, this starts at Southampton, goes to Alcatraz, goes around Alcatraz and Harding. It shouldn't be Little Harding, it should be Harding. Yeah, it is Harding Rock, 17. And then you get to choose which side of Angel Island you go on. And you go up and you go around the Brothers and come back and finished at the Richmond Yacht Club. And that's been a very popular race. And again, it's a, a chance for people to either single hand or double hand. We try to encourage both. Um, another race we have is the Corinthian race, a uh, single and double handed favorite, which is Little Harding, Block, Black Holler, Southampton, starting to finish. Uh, this race this year, we had a bit of a problem with it. We had a restart near Alcatraz so that all the boats kind of clumped together and then sailed up the city front. So we had literally 120 boats on the city front at once with no separation between classes or anything. So I think that we're going to cons reconsider this and try to avoid the situation where, where we get a restart in the middle of the race and too many boats because I've sailed many cl um, class races, uh, one design races on the city front and they're usually separated quite nicely by classes, and each class stays in its own area. Occasionally, there's some overlap, but that's unusual. But um, when you get a restart with 120 boats on the city front, it's chaos. So look for some changes on that. And finally, we want to talk about our biggest race, the Three Bridge Fiasco. Um, the number of arrows you see on the screen is about half the number of arrows that we could have because it assumes that everything is rounded in one direction or the other. And in fact, you can round any of them in any direction so you could have several figure eights involved in this. Um, we have 
managed to make this one of the largest races in the country. Uh, it's a big, big draw, and a lot of people love the race. It was um, thought of by um, the race chair at the time, Ants Wiga. And um, he's quite an interesting character. There he is by his more 24. So the race committee, the board of directors of the Single-Handed Sailing Society decided that we needed, we needed another race then. At that time, Chuck Hawley was Commodore, Hans Huiga, Peter Hogg and Shama were involved, and Dan Newland and Graham Hawks. Uh, but there were some problems. Um, didn't want it to co conflict and needed to fit it into uh, the, um, the winter months. The problems were the January sailing was either no wind or storms, a high runoff and fast currents, and hard to set a course. This is where Ants, who was actually kind of a humble guy, said, well, there's a lot of skippers out there who know more about this than I do, so we should let them set their own course. So the solution was to let the skippers determine the course, to have a reverse handicap, so that the first boat to complete the course wins. Uh, there, there was a time limit of 6 p.m. It's now 7 p.m. And uh, it's single-handed and double-handed divisions. And they found a hole in the YRA schedule on Super Bowl Saturday. Well, I don't remember it being on Saturday, and I don't remember it being in January, but apparently it was in, uh, at that time, 78. So the results of the first winner were uh, Lester Roberts in his more 24 legs. There were 40 starters and only two finished. And double-handed Susan Baugh and Linda Newland in, her range, in their range of 23. Now, Linda Newland keeps showing up in the, uh, along with Dan Newland, in the SSS history. She did the Trans-Pacific race. Uh, she also did a race from San Francisco to Kobe, Japan, and was one of the winners, first winners of the Three Bridge fiasco. So she's certainly left her mark. Um, Latitude 38 had a lovely article on the uh, first Three Bridge fiasco. And I was just amazed that they had all these drawings instead of photos, and I'm really quite intrigued with them. Um, and it was quite an effort on their part, and quite a lovely layout, I thought. And I, I wish they'd do it again, but I'm sure that it, uh, they needed a certain person with a certain skill that they had then. And, um, in the lower right is um, Susan Vaughn and, and Linda. So the Three Bridge fiasco has always been a bit of a crapshoot. <laughs> Not only do you have a small chance of winning against 300 and some other boats, but you have uh, a small chance of finishing. The first race in 1978, there were 40 boats and two finishers, and that set, set the uh, uh, the model for for the race. Um, I went back in latitude to try to find uh, as many records as possible, and uh, I hit 2005 uh, for their published things that are published online. And you can see that, well, there was sort of between 2006 and 2013, you had a pretty good chance of finishing. But then 2014, we only had one finisher. 2015, 
Well, 55 finishers, but that's 15%. Then a good year in 2016. 2017, down to 6%. 2018, down to 1%. A good year in uh, 2019, and then this year we have 42 finishers. So it takes a bit of humor to get involved in this race and just go out and give it a try and hope that you can finish. Um, one of the things we do in the Single-Handed Sailing Society is change the rules a little bit for shorthanding. For shorthanding. Uh, use of autopilots uh, or wind-powered self-steering gear, twin head sails or two poles. And uh, uh, the third one here is we want to make sure that people with power winches have them declared on their PHRF certificate. So for the future, um, we hope to continue um, blossoming as an uh, all-volunteer organization. We hope to maintain our safety record with our seminars. We um, seem to have the most meetings. We have a skipper's meeting before every race, and um, the uh, veterans of the Single-Handed Sailing Society are always very welcome to share their knowledge with anyone who might be new. Uh, we focus on the development of shorthanded sailing. Uh, in fact, we try to lure people in. Um, if you, somebody starts the uh, Three Bridge fiasco and has a good time, well, maybe they'll come back for another shorthanded race, or maybe they'll try a single-handed race, or maybe they'll go out offshore and go around the Farallons. Or maybe, like myself, you do everything and then say, well, it's time to go to Hawaii. The um, rise, race in, the rise in popularity of short and sailing has been very uh, fortunate for the Single-Handed Sailing Society. Many boats are now designed to be sailed short-handed. So unlike my Olsen 30, where we had sometimes six or seven on the crew, um, even on a crew, even with a crewed race, I would have three, and it's easy to sail on its own. Um, we hope that education and safety and seamanship make single-handed sailing a continuing option. It's often been criticized for um, people not having a watch all the time. And I think that that's a valid criticism, but new developments in things like AIS and class B AIS and alarms and things like that really help the single-handed sailor and help the others, other boats on the ocean know where the single-handed sailors are. And finally, I'd like to give a shout out to the many yacht clubs that work with the Single-Handed Sailing Society to run the races. We start a lot of our races at the Golden Gate Yacht Club. Corinthian has a race named after it. We finish a couple of our races at the Richmond Yacht Club, and we sail to Vallejo and Half Moon Bay. And in Drake's Bay, the Inverness Yacht Club comes out and does a committee work for us. And of course, we have to thank the YRA and their scheduling for everything that they do to keep all the yacht clubs working together. So with that, I'd like to thank you for letting me talk about the Single-Handed Sailing Society and the Three Bridge Fiasco. <laughs> it's wonderful. It's uh, great to have uh, you on, Don. And uh, many of us who've raced in a three bridge uh, consider it really the most fun race of the year. I particularly think of it as that. Uh, it's actually the most ingenious race. And um, I think it's important to recognize that um, many of the things which you're doing are counter to recent trends in 
race management within the, on the West Coast. Um, it used to be when I was a kid and started sailing and racing in the 50s that uh, race time was set and date was set. And even if there was no win, the race would, would uh, take place. Then I began sailing in the 70s and 80s on the East Coast some, and I noticed that races would get started and stopped and started and stopped and or postponed until there was a certain minimum amount of win, especially that was the case in Long Island Sound. Uh, American Yacht Club and Larchmont were famous for doing that. And while I love those clubs and they're great racing out there, I never really appreciated the fact that a race would start or stop based upon some minimum win requirement. You and the Single-Handed Sailing Society run the Three Bridge Fiasco at the same preset time in the progressive start. Uh, my boat, Youngsters, usually starts like around 9.37 or 38. And regardless of when, that's the start time. I think that causes, um, you know, that causes each skipper to be more, you know, thoughtful about uh, what he's going to do, whether he's going to basically, you know, uh, you know, what kind of sails you're going to put up. In, in some cases, you can have your boat re-rated for a masthead or not a masthead uh, rig, and you can decide that based upon whether you think it's going to be light air or heavy air, and you can decide which way you want to go right up to the last second. Scott Easton gave me a piece of advice one year. He said, I said, well, okay, what do you think about tomorrow? And he said, Ron, my best advice is be north of the, of the starting pin just before the start in it, three minutes to the starting pin, be headed toward it, and in the last 30 seconds decide whether you're going to run the starting pin to port and go uh, east or run it to starboard and go west for the first part of the leg. And that's turned out to be pretty doggone good advice. So later I seem to decide in the course the better we seem to do. Let's see, a couple of questions. Um, in the structure of the three bridge, um, how many meetings do you have in the race committee uh, in the year before you actually, you know, during the year to plan the race? Do you have physical meetings? Are they face-to-face -face or do you do them virtually with the other people on the race committee? Well, the uh, race chair usually presents at the skipper's meeting uh, on the Wednesday before the race. And, uh, we actually have some veterans of the race committee that keep showing up. Uh, we have one guy, I, I haven't met him. Um, he's called the guy from New York. And uh, <laughs> he was able to uh, list the numbers, sale numbers of eight more 24s that started into one group. And this was just an ability that he had to have such a photographic memory. There's also a, a story of uh, Peter Hogg on Aotea and Cami Richards, and, uh, and some debate whether this was proper or not. But uh, in a strong flood, they went uh, west of the starting line, dropped their anchor, and put out as much line as possible to get east of the starting line. <laughs> and then when their gun went off, they started pulling their anchor in. Well, they could have been OCS, I suppose, but it's <laughs> one of the things that people have done. Yeah, yeah, points for innovation on that one, but I don't think it's it. I don't think we're a yes on that deal. You, can't, you and I know you can't use your anchor line to catch yourself forward in racing, but they're both incredibly innovative people, so. Lots of points for innovation there. Yeah. Um, so how many people, I've always wondered, during the start, it's so amazing. There's like, you know, 300 boats on the, in the starting area or thereabouts, a couple hundred boats. How many people are on the starting deck of the GGYC at the start of the race? Well, what we've had to do is um, we've had to split the check-in between two channels. So uh, we have our race channel, usually 72. Yeah. And uh, so we'll have the even number boats up at 72 and the odd number boats on 71. And we had problems with this because when you hit transmit on one radio, it would wipe out the other one. So uh, someone came up with a design for an antenna that is two antennas vertically um, pointing the opposite direction, which we hoist up the... Uh, a flagpole and so they don't interfere with each other by uh, 
not being parallel to each other. And we're able to get them all in. The, uh, there are usually about five or six people on the race committee. Uh, I think one of the most difficult things of the race committee is because we do this with a permit from the Coast Guard, uh, at the end of a race, we have to call the Coast Guard and say we're finished and you know we've got all our boats accounted for. Well, do we have all our boats accounted for? The race committee has to track them down, calling phone numbers, calling VHF to find out whether somebody's just retired to their to their home or whether they're still out on the water and uh, so it's sometimes taken a couple extra hours to get everyone accounted for. So talk to us a little bit about the structure of the Single-Handed Sailing Society. Uh, the Commodore, is that, uh, what's the length of term and do you matriculate through chairs like the Rear Commodore, Vice Commodore, uh, and then Commodore, or how do you do it? Um, no, I believe we use the short straw method. <laughs> <laughs> Don't miss a meeting or you could be elected. <laughs> <laughs> um, usually we, um, it, it's often a um, honor that goes to the winner of the Trans-Pacific race. And before me, David Harrigal, he won his year. Um, uh, and, uh, it, and usually if it's not the winner, it's a participant who's uh, able, able to do it. And um, as I say, I'm a little worried this year, um, as there isn't a trans-Pacific race. I don't know who my successor will be. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready to resume retirement at any time at the drop of a hat. <laughs> <laughs> so how many committees are in the, um, first of all, how many members are in the Single Hand Sailing Society? Um, well, we probably, usually we have about, 250 um, people sign up for the full season. Uh -huh. okay. And with the rest of them doing single races. And so to make our 350 votes, we might have 250 full season racers and 150 one time uh, entries. Uh, we've got it set up so it's actually uh, very cost efficient to uh, sign up for the full season and get out there and try another race. Um, you know, uh, if you do two races, you paid for your full season um, on single race fees. So why not join for the season, do a couple more races and get involved in more shorthanded sailing and maybe single handed sailing. Yes, and so uh, it's interesting too, one of your board members, Harmon Schrag, is currently sailing in the Clipper Yacht Race. Last, uh, last uh, he emailed me, he was uh, near Asia. They were not stopping in China because of the pandemic. Um, but it seems like you guys have a pretty active uh, board in terms of racers. Uh, like definitely so. Um, yeah, there was a picture in Latitude of uh, Harmon with uh, Sir Robin Knox Johnson. <laughs> I really <don't> like <laughs> uh, So that that's uh, that's uh, that's pretty high up there. Uh, Brian Boshima, who is the Trans Pacific Race Chairman, has. Uh, um, done the race several times, um, and uh, uh, myself, um, Kristen, who's our treasurer, has um, kind of replaced Shama as being the voice of the Single-Handed Sailing Society, the voice you hear when you check in that says, welcome, Don, have a good race. <laughs> and, uh, um, we have a, a Randy is our a new communi communications director as we're branching out from, from just the website and using social media. And uh, we may have to try other things for our skippers meeting if we uh, have social distancing 
um, in order to, to get the information out to people and to remind them, you know, to be safe and to remind them of the minimum equipment that we all need and to make sure that the, there's a level playing ground for everyone. Are there any size, minimum size requirements in your Trans-Pacific race Are there, uh, or any other races? Minimum length of boat, I mean? Um, I, I'm not really sure. Um, I've seen some pretty small boats out there. Yeah, you, uh, you mentioned a 22, a Santana 22, racing in the Trans-Pacific early. Yeah. That was the first one. Uh, there may have been other. There may have been others uh, that are as small, but um, I believe it's you know uh, it's up to the skipper and it's up to the inspector because they do get inspected and you know are they seaworthy and are they able to meet the requirements for food and water and communications and all the other safety. So in 214, uh, I remember that race, that was the 214 um, Three Bridge. That was such an adventure. I came under the Golden Gate Bridge from um, West East at least six times in that race before not finishing. And I remember Rod Hagbolds, who uh, went, came up, uh, went west from the starting line to Black Holler, rounded it in cleverly, very smartly sailed as far east as, you know, almost to St. Francis before he headed over to Raccoon Straits. And that was such a clever move. The ebb was so strong that year. And um, when you go about deciding on your own course, talk to us a little bit about your process and how you plan in advance, what, what devices you use to sort of stage out, um, you know, which direction you're planning to go, or which course you're planning to take. Well, uh, my basic key is to try to avoid mistakes I've made in previous years. <laughs> One of the mistakes difficult. I've made. <laughs> It'll be difficult for some of us who've made so many mistakes. But <laughs> right. One of the mistakes I've made is getting washed out the Golden Gate Bridge with a strong runoff. I, and resemble, no wind. That. I, I resemble that remark. <laughs> and uh, you know, uh, one rule of thumb is always head for your first mark. Always head for your home port, <laughs> <laughs> just in case. <laughs> just in case. Plan B. Yeah. No, really. Uh, so what I have done, and not that this is um, uh, to be recommended, but. Um, I basically sit down and plot out, okay, um, I have some sense about what I think the wind's going to be doing, not that that's ever correct. And then I say to myself, okay, if I start here and I sail for a half an hour from the starting line, let's say to a Treasure Island, and if it's flooding, it takes me X length of time. And then I look at the current chart, and you and I know those are set usually with tables that are very, very antique. Uh, and then I say, okay, 40 minutes from then, I'm going to be here, you know, somewhere near, you know, uh, Berkeley, heading that way, heading uh, east and west, I mean, east and north. And I kind of plot it out and I look at what's happening at each of the times over what usually is a five-hour race, where I think I'm going to be. And then I, what I found to be most successful uh, is to then say, okay, now, what if that's wrong? Give me another plan. What's funny is frequently the second or third plan I come up with wins. And so uh, Youngster has raced in the biggest division usually because it's a 33 foot boat and there's lots of boats that size. But in winning our class three times uh, only, um, it's usually been that I actually changed my mind just before the start. So <laughs> what does that have to do? Tell me, tell me the, the value or clear lack of value of planning in advance for this race versus deciding, you know, based on circumstances just at the beginning of the at your starting time. Talk to me about what works for you. Well, I think that you have to uh, uh, be able to uh, appraise the conditions at the start. Uh, we often have Cammy come and talk to us and he's the 
uh, at the skipper's meeting. He's the expert on the currents in the bay, and of course, as a sailmaker, he's the expert on the winds. And then um, Cameo usually say clockwise or counterclockwise, but um, the, then you watch Cammy, and he doesn't follow his own advice. <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed that. Yes, I have observed that. <laughs> that, gets so, another, that gets me to another part of, of, of your, for, what I'm going to call formula, although that implies planning. I don't know that you're guilty of any, you know, extreme amount of that. But what I love, one of the things I really love about first the race, and then really the single-handed sailing society itself, is that you totally recognize that this is a recreational activity, that this is what we do for fun. Yeah. And the tongue-in-cheek nature of the single-handed sailing society, I find to be so refreshing. Um, you know, there are so few straw hats and blazers, and so many laughs, <laughs> and so many laughs on the race course. I give you. Lots of points for humor. And uh, we enjoy that too. Uh, and I think that that's one of the things that drew me to the Single-Handed Sailing Society and, and the camaraderie and the sharing of knowledge too. Um, I remember when I first started sailing my Olsen 30 on, on the ocean, and I don't think that that boat would now qualify to go out in the ocean. It would need so much more safety equipment. But I, I had a, a circular steering rope that went from my tiller um, in front of the mast and around. So I could go up and sit on the foredeck and steer the boat uh, while either changing sails or hoisting a spinnaker or dousing a spinnaker or jibing. And um, this was uh, an idea that was um, developed by another Olsen 30 sailor and shared by several people. And that worked for a couple of years until I got a tiller pilot. But um, um, it works very well. And it's a lot of fun. Yeah, so let me see if I can visualize this. So you tie a line from the tiller. Let's say you go port to a turning block on the port rail or someplace on the port side of the boat. Then you go forward in front of the mast to some kind of turning block, bullet block or whatever. Then you come back to the starboard side, abreast of the tiller, and then you come back yeah. to the tiller. Oh, yeah. that's, that's a clever rig. That's a cool yeah. idea. So you can basically trim the sail anywhere you're next to, or trim the, the, the steer the course, any time you're next to that line, fore and aft on either side. Very cool. Yeah, that's cool. That's a cool thing. So. Uh -huh. I remember on my first single-handed Farallons race, um, I wasn't sure what I would do, but I hoisted at the Farallons, hoisted the spinnaker, and uh, had a porthole, I think, all the way coming in. And I knew the South Tower monster. Uh, I knew it existed, <laughs> and I was just waiting for it. And so all the way in, what, however many hours it was, you know, it, I alternated to saying to myself, I'll douse, I'll jive. I'll douse, I'll try the jive. I'll douse, I'll try the jive. So when I finally got there, I came in under the center of the bridge, uh, went up with my circular steering rope, um, took the pole off, and got knocked over. <laughs> so I tried to steer back, I got the boat up, and got knocked over the other way. <laughs> So finally, I got knocked over in the direction I wanted to go, put the pole up, ran back to the tiller, got the boat <laughs> vertical again, got the mast pointing up again, and finished the race. <laughs> it was exciting. And that's the type of excitement that I've had with, with the uh, Single-Handed Sailing Society. Not only that race, but certainly on the Hawaii race as well. <laughs> the South Tower monster can even hit uh, crude boats uh, in a Drake yes. race. Uh, when would it have been about 82 or so? We were racing in a boat I had called Fast Friends Santana 35 at the time. And as we came to the South Tower, uh, um, we had jived onto starboard because we had tried to stay over on the on the north side of the Benita Channel and try to stay out of the ebb that was there. 
anyway, we're cutting across and um, we spun out just as we got near the South Tower. And I found myself with, if you, if you know a Santana 35, they're very beamy boats, they're nicknamed Tunas. Anyway, the boat was heeled over, starboard, port side down, starboard side up, full kind of aiming toward, you know, the top of the bridge. And I don't think we got within, I don't think we, we didn't get closer than maybe the bow three feet from the South Tower when I finally got the boat under control and just missed it. By golly, those are big pilings that are surround that South Tower. But it was, uh, that was one heck of a monster. So when you're in those, when you're sailing single-handed, and this was a crude boat, we had maybe seven, eight guys on the boat at this time. When you're, when you're single-handed sailing uh, your boat, uh, what other things are you doing? For instance, um, when you're going across on the Trans-Pacific, when are you snapped in? If ever, when are you snapped in? Talk to me about that. Um, I think I was snapped in all the time. You were always I, I, on I, I, yeah, I had a tether that came down into the cabin, mm -hmm. and when I was going up on deck, I clipped it on. Mm -hmm. And um, so, not just uh, at night, not just when breeze, pretty much all the time you were snapped in. Yeah, that was just a habit. I just made it a habit. So, um, when I was a little boy, young young guy, and even in my twenties and thirties, I raced with this great legendary sailor named Jake Wasser. And uh, Wasser had a couple boats. He had a boat called Rutson, uh, an IOD that I raced on, um, 79. And then he also had K2, uh, Kettenberg, um, 38. And he raced that boat too. And in uh, over a thousand races in the Bay, it was often said then and still <coughs> now, uh, and I was reminded by his uh, one time son-in-law, Jeff Madrigali, when I mentioned this to him, that in over a thousand races in the Bay, nobody can ever remember a single time when Jake the Snake, it was his nickname, Jake the Snake Wasser, ever filed a protest. What is the Single-Handed Sailing Society's attitude or appetite for the sea lawyers in the world who choose to protest their way to the front of the pack? <laughs> well, um, there have been some protests. There is. One story that I only know secondhand um, that uh, has to do with uh, uh, someone protesting our sailing instructions because <laughs> <laughs> because the, uh, uh, the the uh, the text of the uh, sailing instructions said that you can't cross the line. Uh, unless to start or finish, but the uh, 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 the part that, that says what rules are modified did not specifically state that that was modified. So uh, this, uh, I believe, somewhat professional skipper looked at what was modified and didn't see it. So he. Um, um, uh, scalped up in both sides of the starting line before his start. Um, and uh, won his division um, uh, and uh, then um, it, he was thrown out because uh, uh, they had films of him crossing the line several times. Um, so uh, uh, I believe that uh, this went to uh, several levels of protests or some East Coast judges got involved and they said, you know, well, he's right, you know, either you have to um, say he's right or you have to throw out the race. So I believe it was Dwight Odom who was Commodore at the time and the uh, uh, rest of the board decided to throw out the race. Dwight Odom had a bunch of uh, bowling trophies. So he had brought in his old bowling trophies and handed them out for various non-first places in a race that was thrown out. So again, it's, it's humor, it's uh, um, camaraderie, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> so this has been a, a real fun Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Uh, I'm, we're not going to switch to the lightning round. I'm going to say a word or a name 
and I want you to give me a quick one word answer. Okay. okay. Uh, so more 24s. Light. <laughs> Express 27s. Lighter. <laughs> <laughs> Trimerans. Uh, E-bone. Catamarans. Fast. A Trans-Pacific race. Uh, exciting. Coastal Cup. Good fun. Um, Stan Honey. Amazing. Peter Hogg. Amazing. <laughs> uh, Single-Handed Sailing Society. Um, a, a, a pillar of uh, sailing. Chuck Hawley. Um, genius. Shama. Uh, delightful. Pleasant. Uh, 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 Chrissy slash black collar buoy. Um, difficult. <laughs> Caroline Islands. Um, distant. <laughs> Single handed sailing. Good fun. Great. Don, it's been great having you as a guest on the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Uh, congratulations on um, the great work that the Single-Handed Sailing Society has done and the metrics, the hard metrics of your success are clearly demonstrated by the fact that you have by all accounts, and I've checked with U.S. Sailing on this, uh, literally officially, and you have the largest sailboat race in America. And um, I think that the ingenious structure of the race has caused it to grow while, as you and I know, Lots of other sailboat racing metrics are showing a decline in boat ownership and recreational uh, racing. So um, uh, congratulations uh, on a job well done. And really the spirit of the Single-Headed Sailing Society seems to applaud and support a meritocracy. You seem to have come up with a formula that has uh, taken the attention away from how much you spend and instead how uh, frequently you laugh and have a good time with your fellow sailors. So thank you very, very much. Uh, I've enjoyed our uh, Wednesday outing luncheon with you and uh, our very best wishes for a, a great future for the Single-Handed Sailing Society. Thank you, our guest today, Don Martin, on the Wednesday outing luncheon, virtual grill room edition. Thank you so much. With that, our meeting is adjourned.